it will be, November 4, rather, it will be 31 years since I lost my embassy in Tehran. It will be 30 years in January since we came home from that experience. These dates mattered to us enormously at the time, and it mattered a great deal for this country at the time, particularly the way in which they involved your parents. Most of you are too young to remember it, but your parents will remember it because they played such a central role in bringing me home, the way the country rallied around in that period with the help of not least yellow ribbons. You all know the concept of the yellow ribbon? You don't know where it started. It started in my home yard, front yard. And my wife paid, uh, wrapped a big yellow oilcloth ribbon around, the oak, around that big oak tree. And it hung there for a long time until Desert won, when my three sons were involved in that war, and where yellow ribbons then were everywhere as a symbol of concern for fellow Americans. That's what it was. That's what it still is. If you want to see the original yellow ribbon, you can go down to the Library of Congress, the Jefferson Building, the Folk Life Division, and ask to see it, and they'll bring it out and show it to you. It's nicely preserved in the big white box. You know the concept of the, of the ribbon. It is now many colors, not least pink. Ambassador Langan is a diplomat. I am not. Um, Ambassador Langan believes that we can engage the Islamic Republic of Iran. I do not. Uh, in fact, I think that the day that, uh, Bruce, you and your colleagues, or your, your former hostages, do manage to go back to Tehran will be the end of the Islamic Republic, because the one thing that they cannot abide by and certainly cannot accept is any kind of normalization with the United States. Uh, the regime, the regime um, will not survive uh, the reopening of a U.S. embassy in Tehran, uh, they would not survive the mile-long lines in front of the, uh, the embassy to get visas to come to the United States. Um, they would not be able to tolerate um, the window onto freedom that the embassy itself, by its very presence, would offer to uh, ordinary Iranians. That their programs, all of their nuclear programs, must A, be transparent, B, be verifiable, C, be under the, uh, uh, the supervision of the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency, and D, if they do not comply with, you know, uh, transparent and verifiable, they do not have rights under the NPT. So Iran has been called by the pro-Islamic Republic Secretary General of the IAEA, Mohammed al baradai as a violator of the NPT. This is a man who spent, you know, five years since their program, their nuclear weapons program, was publicly exposed in 2003. al baradai spent five years defending them and defending their rights, and yet he himself acknowledged publicly uh, that Iran is in violation of its NPT commitments. It seems to me that we don't have a very credible deterrent when we let them get away with that kind of nonsense. Uh, and so if we're going to engage in a kind of U.S.-Soviet style of dialogue with the Islamic Republic of Iran, we need to develop a credible deterrent that actually deters them from doing the bad things that they continue doing to us and that they never stopped after January 20th, 1981. Clearly, clearly, sanctions have had some impact uh, on the regime, but we've also seen that this is a regime which is uh, quite prepared. To, or, or, this is a regime which has a high tolerance for economic pain, as long as especially that pain is of somebody else's, is somebody else's. So they're quite prepared to see the Iranian people suffer. They're quite prepared to see the oil fields rust. You know, equipment in the oil fields rust because they can't get new equipment to to uh, renew the oil fields. Uh, they don't really care. Economic pain uh, is not tremendously important. Khomeini said, remember, right after the revolution, there were sanctions, worldwide sanctions against Iran and the seizing of Iran's assets. He said, well, it doesn't matter because the revolution is not about the price of watermelons. You know, who cares about the economy? It doesn't matter. We are about an ideology, which is why, Bruce, we cannot treat the Islamic Republic of Iran like an ordinary country. It is a regime. It is an ideological regime. It does not respect its people. It does not have the same cost-benefit analysis that an ordinary country would have. Mm. Uh, yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you're saying. Here's what I think. This is all going to come into one big picture. I think it's a, it's a long circle of change. 
chain where what why Obama didn't take any sides was because if they would take any sides, the regime would take advantage of that and say, look, the United States again is trying to take over and it would make us look much worse than it is now. Rather, what we really need in Iran is, is a Persian leader. Just the same way as we had Khomeini. There has to be a Persian leader. There has to be a Persian leader that sits in and says, I'm behind the whole crowd, let's go forward. And then that has, that has to be organized, the way you said. Now, the, the, the economical problems that we have now right now in Iran may not be the only answer, but it is tightening it up. It is getting it harder. People are getting tired. This is where we need a Persian leader to step up. Good question. If you, if you ask the regime or you look at the CIA fact book, I think it's 99% Shiite. That's not true. In fact, Iran is only – is maybe a majority Persian. Maybe. Not even certain that that's true either. Um, you have uh, – we don't have a map here, but, it, but it, 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 let me just take a figurative map of Iran. Uh, I'm, I, I can't draw. Can I write on this board? Okay. I can't draw, so, so please forgive me. So we're just going to do it like this and like that, okay? Here's the Persian Gulf. Here's Iraq, right? Iraq. Uh, here's Afghanistan, right? And Pakistan is down here. And the stands are all up there, all right? All the way around the periphery are, are Sunnis. You have Kurds up here, right? Huh? You have Abazis down here. Abaz down here. You have uh, you have all different kinds of you know Gulf Arabs, Baluchis down here. You have Baluchis down here. You have Turkomens up here near the near the stands, and uh, you have uh, various kinds of folks going all the way up. Baluchis mainly going up here. They're all Sunnis on the periphery. Only the heartland is. Pars province, right? And Tehran, there in the capital. Now I see I'm going to lose my Iranian American people here. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, if, again, if you, you, you dealt with the Azeri, excuse me, I forgot the Azeris up here. So there's something like you know, maybe 12 million Azeris, you know, 15 million Kurds out of a population of 70 million. So there's a huge population of minorities in Iran, and most of those minorities are Sunni Muslims, and there's not a single Sunni Muslim mosque in Tehran. Not a single one. They've been asking for 30 years of the regime, can we have a Sunni Muslim mosque? Not a single one. So you have religious repression inside Islam, inside the Islamic Republic, and you have people turning away from Islam all the time, and yet they proclaim themselves as the Islamic Republic, and they want to achieve an Islamic bomb to uh, nuke Israel and to uh, basically bring the 12th Imam back. But they all make Persian carpets. <laughs> Uh, what's stopping all those people from creating revolt is lack of organization, uh, tremendous, tremendous um, uh, repression by the regime, training by the KGB in the early stages of the regime, you know, right after the takeover in 1979. The, K the KGB basically trained Iran's intelligence services. How do I know that? Because I know the people who were involved in it, okay? Uh, personally, and, uh, and so the KGB was in there in a very, very big way, you know, training them, how do you break resistance? How do you prevent opposition? How do you create a gulag? You know, how do you keep your people down? It was what the Soviets did for all those years. It was what the uh, KGB did for all those years. And the Iranians were great students of that. They learned very, very well. They probably have the most effective intelligence uh, organization in the world today, in the world today. I mean, if you consider repression, <laughs> keeping the regime in power to be uh, signs of success. We wouldn't in this country. Uh, but from their perspective, they've got a tremendously powerful and effective intelligence. Uh, uh, I couldn't structure. agree more. The regime is in control. Yes. But they can be broken. They can be broken. They can be broken. It's another discussion, perhaps. They can be broken. But it takes a policy from us here in this country and a willingness to actually recognize the threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran, which we 
which we are not doing. We are not recognizing the existential threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran. They want to destroy us. The regime wants to destroy us. They say this openly. They say it openly. Uh, and the only reason they have not used a nuclear weapon against us is because they don't have one yet. Uh, that you can read in my novel. That, that I write about in the novel. I guess, how does that affect the regime, you know, not only keeping its power, but actually expanding it in the region? Uh, I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, and this, gets all, this also gets back to perceptions and perceptions of weakness. They believe that we are weak. They believe that we are weak because we are not confronting them when they are confronting us. If they're going out and killing American soldiers, and what are we doing about it? Nothing. You know, we arrest a couple of their people, as we did in Iraq. We had the Kazali network that we, that we rolled up, that, that you know, our, our troops and intelligence people rolled up in Iraq. And uh, you know, year, this was a network that was uh, bringing in IEDs from Iran, giving them to the insurgents to blow up Americans, to kill Americans. And we arrested them. That was great. Two years later, we released them. We turned them over to, um, to um, uh, the prime minister of Iraq. He brings the Iranian ambassador into his office and says, oh, well, you know, we're going to give these people back to you. You're supposed to put them in prison. And they walked out and went home. And, and the Iranians see that, and they laugh. They laugh at us. They say, America is a threat to us. Forget it. We can defeat America. It's very simple. They're not even, we are not even confronting them when they are killing us. Uh, that, is, that is the real problem that I've got with American policy. And by the way, it's not just Obama. This is during the Bush administration as well. You know, there was a, there was a uh, view from the top of the Pentagon and the intelligence community and the State Department that if we confront Iran, we will have war. We will have another war. We will be at war with Iran, and we don't want that. Screwed up already in Iraq. I don't want to have a war in Iran. And I believe it was, it was based on a flawed analysis of what was going on, and a flawed understanding of the Iranian mentality, and a flawed understanding of the regime. And in fact, our weakness merely encouraged further attacks and further deaths of Americans. Did I hear you say that the Iranians have not used a nuclear weapon against us because they don't have one? Yes. That they would? Yes. And they've said that they would. I don't accept that.